Amen. Amen. Would you take your Bibles, open them to Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3 in a Bible study that I've entitled, Even Though I Don't Know the Future. Even Though I Don't Know the Future. You know, today people are very discouraged. I would say deeply discouraged. There are so many uncertainties around us, so much unfairness and challenges all throughout 2020 and now into 2021. It's really taken its toll. Mental health issues, anxieties, fears, at the bottom of so many hearts, even among us today is a deep sense of discouragement. Maybe even as you're facing things, you, fatalism has crept into your heart where you just throw up your hands and go, well, whatever, this is what it's gonna be. You add to that a new atmosphere, both in our culture, but also into the church, even into our church. A culture, an atmosphere of skepticism, division, criticism, conspiracy theories, and it's become a very hard world to navigate. It was hard enough. And it's become very challenging to navigate through this new world. And in the 24 plus years that I've personally been in pastoral ministry, I have never seen so much division and difficulties ever in the entirety of my ministry, ever. It seems like through 2020 and 2021, I've seen more division, caustic, nastiness. Um, I've seen so much that, that just in the last year and a half that covers the whole years of ministry prior. And believe me, I've seen a few things through the years here. It seems like affirmation and support and agape love is being discouraged by powerful societal trends, political strife, cynicism, distrust, suspicion, negativity, envy, and a general feeding of bad news. And they all combine together to chill our hearts. Just like the Bible said, in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. I know you read that and you think, yeah, the love of this world will grow cold, but that's not the entirety of context. It's also the love of Christians, of believers will grow cold in a time in the last days. And church, you're seeing it with your own eyes right now, maybe even experiencing it, where being right and establishing what's right is more important than being right in love and caring for the other person in love. To me, it's terrible to see the critical culture around us seep into how we relate to one another in the church of Jesus Christ. And as believers and the pastors among us and the leaders and servants among us, God has enabled us to help each other keep our eyes and our lives firmly fixed upon our Savior. Even in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, you know, the Bible says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you. That really is the place of spiritual warfare, our minds. Like the hymn writer once said, O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see? There's a light for the look of a savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Today I wanna to remind you that even though I don't know the future, I will choose to trust in the Lord. Even though we don't know the future, we will trust in the Lord. Isn't that your heart today? Aren't you looking for an anchor in a very chaotic world? A place where you can have your feet firmly fixed as the winds and the storms of life beat down on your life and on your home and on your family. I don't know the future, so then, therefore I'm faced with choices. Faith or fear? Forward or backward, follow or run away, steadiness or freak out, choices abound. I know somehow we think that if we only knew what was up ahead, things today would be so much better. If God would just tell us how it's going to come down, show us what daily it's going to look like, things would be so much better, encouraging, and peaceful today. I mean, you think about it in your life right now. Will I get that job? Will I lose my job? Will this problem work itself out? Where will I live? How will I feed? Who, who will I marry? 
How, how long will I live? These are all questions that are plaguing us and concerning us. I think of how long, how will things turn out with our current government? Uh, what will happen with mandates and viruses and so much swirling around us? But you know, life is not like that. God leads us moment by moment, step by step. He's developing in us a deep, a wa abiding walk and life of faith. He doesn't give us the whole picture. He, he doesn't tell us how everything is going to line up. Instead, he wants us to trust him. The Bible says this. Jot it down, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. The Bible says, So we are always confident knowing that while we're at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by, say it with me, church. Let me read it. Let me set you up again. For we walk by faith and not by the problem is, is you want to walk by sight. Many of the sinful mistakes that we make as believers is because we've chosen to walk by sight. We experience a situation, we hear a troubling report, and we immediately respond to what we see or what we hear. And it's always a mistake. Today we're reminded that even though we don't know the future, we can rely upon the faithfulness of God. We have an example of that here in Joshua chapter three. Notice with me in verse one. Then Joshua rose early in the morning and they set out from the Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan. That would be the Jordan River. He and all the children of Israel, they lodged there before they crossed over. So it was that after three days, the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord your God and the priests and the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go. And then mark this. If you don't already have it marked, mark this phrase. For you have not passed this way before. You have not passed this way before, church. Everything that we're currently experiencing in the moment, we have not passed this way before. And here's the thing, because we haven't passed this way before, our life is filled with uncertainty. We simply don't know the future. You need to acknowledge that in your life. You don't know the future. I know a lot of people would want to argue about it, want to say, oh, no, we, no, Look, collectively, we don't know the future. We don't know how things are going to turn out. We don't know the decisions that are going to be made. We don't know the situations that are going to affect us. We don't know why, because we haven't passed this way before. Here is the nation of Israel on the edge of the promised land. This is it. This is what they've been waiting for during their 40 year death march of disobedience. Remember, prior to this time, you, you've got the nation wandering around the wilderness because of their unbelief, the Bible says. They, they received the consequences of their unbelief by a whole generation dying in the wilderness. These are now their kids and their grandkids. They are experiencing the promises of God. They're about ready to go in. They're going to get everything that they expect. It, it's like, like you, you have that anticipation. Things are going to get better. We're going to get the promises of God. It's going to be good. But you have to understand something. They don't know what's going to happen in their life right now. They don't know. They don't know. You and I, when we read the Bible, unfortunately, or fortunately to some degree, but unfortunately, we know the whole story. We know how. We know there's chapter 4, chapter 5. We know they're going to get to the end of the chapter, and Joshua is going to distribute the land just like he said. We know the end. They don't. They're living it real time. And in real time right now, they are at the edge of a river that's overflowing its banks. They're at the edge of a place of another impossibility. That They are poised to go in with great expectation, but they don't know yet that what the promised land will include is a lot of fighting, a lot of battles, a lot of death. They don't know about the unusual way that God is going to lead them in Jericho. They don't know about Rahab yet. They don't know about how things are going to happen where there's going to be great victory in Jericho only to be soundly defeated, defeated in the promised land. Like things are going to get harder for them, not easier for them in many ways. 
They don't know. And I want you for a moment to consider your own current circumstances. You don't know the future. It could get better. It could get worse. But what do we do in the meantime? I want to give you three words and three things in this text that will help you when you come to the place in any area of life where you go, even though I don't know the future, there are three things that always come up when we are faced with the unknown when we are faced with something that we are unable to dictate the future. If you want to take notes, number one, uncertainty. Number two, fear. And number three, newness. Uncertainty, fear, and newness. Let's look at number one, uncertainty. Uncertainty develops a new dependence upon the Lord. Let me repeat that. When you're faced with uncertainty, uncertainty develops a new dependence upon the Lord. In front of the children of Israel here is perhaps in front of you right now something that we could call the great, and I quote, unknown. The great unknown. What's up ahead, we just don't know. We're unsure. And there is an uncertainty to the future because you haven't passed this way before. You simply don't know what's up ahead. And God is ready to lead us through this difficult place. God is ready to teach us deep dependence. God is ready in our uncertainties to encourage us and strengthen us. Let me show you. Turn over to James chapter 4, would you? That's to the right. Since we spent all that time in Hebrews, James is the very next book. James chapter 4. I want you to see this in your own Bibles. James chapter 4. When you get there... Pick up with me in verse 13. James gives us great insight on this season of uncertainty in our lives. Verse 13, come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. Verse 17 is very important because it's often taken out of context. The context of to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him is a sin, is getting caught up in the future and being worried about the future and planning all the way into the future, expecting God to act a certain way. It says, no, the good thing to do, when you know to do good, and that is to trust in the Lord. That, that is to place your trust in the Lord because you realize that your life is a very quick vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. It's just here for a little bit of time. And we learn to say, if the Lord wills, those are words of dependence. Where you come to the place and go, whatever you want for me, God, however you want to use me. I don't know what the future holds, but I trust you and I'm learning to trust you. We don't have to argue this fact, church. The future is uncertain to all of us. None of us know the future. I don't know what might happen in my life. I want to know. I think that in my mind, if God would just lay it all out for me, then I could, man, I just would feel so much better, but that's just not true. If God told you that a horrible calamity would happen in a year and a half from now, it would ruin the next year and a half of your life. You you would be completely, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you would respond. One way you would respond, you would try to do everything in your power possible to avoid that day. Like you would cross it off on your calendar and you would say, like you would travel to another place. Like you you would want, this is the natural response. You're watching it right now. When things are outside of our control, we clamor for some kind of control. And if we were told some calamity, we, it would wreck us. Because God doesn't give us the future. What he does is he meets us in the future with the grace that we need to face the day. Just today. What's happening in the church today, they're getting so caught up in hypothetical theories and things that maybe this and what about this and have this and if this happens, this, and they're all caught up in these, all these hypothetical things. They're worrying about tomorrow and forgetting about today. You see, uncertainty is not designed to get you caught up in what ifs. 
The uncertainty is designed to build your faith in God. If the Lord wills. We can face anything in life in the will of God. Pain, sorrow, difficulty. Hey, maybe things will get better. Maybe they'll get better in the future. We praise the Lord. Maybe they won't. Maybe your next battle will be Jericho and there's victory. But maybe your next battle will be Ai and there's defeat. The children of Israel don't have any idea what's up ahead, except God is teaching them to depend upon him. Number two, not only is there uncertainty, but there's also fear. There's fear. There's real bona fide fear, even among us today. And God wants me to remind you that it's not a sin to be fearful. Fear is natural and normal when we face things that are outside of our control, when there's uncertainty. When there's uncertainty, there is a sense of fear. Now, we've studied in previous studies how fear can become irrational, and we can make bad decisions for sure. But fear is an emotion that God has given to us for good reasons. It pauses us. It causes us to look at things with caution, to examine things a little more clearly, a little bit more slowly. And with fear, number two, Fear develops a new faith walk with the Lord. So from dependence now comes a walk with the Lord, forward progress. Forward progress with dependence and faith. Now I do say so many do fear the future. I don't know how hard it's going to get. I don't know how high the mountains are that I must cross. I don't know how deep and difficult the valleys that will shadow me along the way. I don't know if I'll be able to stand up against the enemies. I don't even know what enemies I'm going to face in the future. I don't know how that financial situation is going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen at work. I don't know what's going to happen with my rental property. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen with my landlord. I don't know what's going to happen in my community. I don't know what the government's going to do. And I don't know anything about the future. But I do know this. Whether it's a mountain to climb or a valley to walk through, my good shepherd will be with me. He will take care of me. He will help me each step of the way. And like the children of Israel here, we're standing at the banks of a rushing river wondering if we'll make it through. I don't know. I'm not sure what God is going to do except that he'll be with me. The future for many stirs up so much fear and anxiety. I know that this verse has been used, unfortunately, in ways to hurt the body of Christ, and I wish, for those using the Bible to hurt people, I wish you would stop. But there's this verse when fear pops up, or the topic of fear, well-minded, maybe even some not well-minded Christians will go, wait a minute, wait a minute, the Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And I did use some kind of emphasis in my voice to make a point. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Calm down. You're right. That scripture is 100% true. But I think it gets misused. Because let's say you're dealing with fear right now, real fear, you. You and me. We're dealing with fears and anxieties. I would say to you this. God has not given you a spirit of fear. He's given to you power and love and a sound mind. What that means is that, yeah, your fear, that irrational fear is not from the Lord, but he's ready to dispel that fear if you trust him. He's ready to work with you if you turn to him. He's ready to, he's ready to help you if you'll just turn your mind toward him and trust him in this scary time. Of course he hasn't given us a spirit of fear. He's faithful and good. But the world instills all kinds of fears in us. And we've got to learn how to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and lean not on our own understanding. To acknowledge him in all our ways and what? He'll direct our paths. He'll walk with us. You see, fear, fear is something that God can use to develop our faith walk with the Lord. Some of you are still unconvinced. You're like, no, 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 Ed, you know, you know fear, fear. Believers shouldn't deal with fear. We should be the most courageous people on the earth. Turn your Bible over to Joshua chapter one for a moment. Joshua, I think we would all agree, is a solid man of God. Just say it with me, amen, if you agree with me. Joshua is a solid man of God, a faithful assistant to Moses, 
God's pick for taking the children of Israel into the promised land? Somebody you would want to follow? Are you guys still here? It's like when I went from like hundreds to two people. Amen. And then it's just an echo. But you get the point. Joshua is the kind of guy that we would want in our lives. If Joshua showed up today and was a candidate from the church to, to pastor this church, I would sit down and I would follow him. That's the kind of man he is. Amen. <laughs> Notice with me chapter one, verse one. After the death of Moses... The servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, the great sea toward going down to the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Notice verse 6. Be strong and of good, say it with me, good courage. Verse 7, only be strong and very... Verse 9, have I not commanded you to be strong and of good courage? What do you think Joshua is dealing with right now? I agree. I think he's very concerned about the future. Oh, it's not that he's not going to face it and he's not going to go through it, but I would suggest to you that he's very, very concerned and fearful about the future. A strong, godly, faithful man. And God meets him. And God doesn't say from heaven in chapter 1, I've given you, a sh like he doesn't bellow from the clouds. What is your problem, Joshua? What, what is, what's your problem? You shouldn't be fearful. You're a man of God. No, he just ministers to him three times. Be strong, be strong, courageous. You're going to be okay. I'm going to be with you. I won't leave you. Nobody's going to stand against you. Like, like this, is, this is the word of the Lord, no matter what he faces. And understand, when he says no one's going to stand before you, that also included AI and defeat. So the fact that nobody's going to stand against you doesn't mean you're not going to be hurt, doesn't mean you're not going to experience failure, doesn't mean you're not going to have hardship. It just means the faithfulness of God will usurp and overrule all the difficulties in your life. Why? Because you're just passing through. Even what Joshua was going through is temporary. Temporary. I think these words in Joshua chapter 1 became treasures in the heart of Joshua words and promises that he could often go back to because there is a natural distress associated with the unknown so i naturally pull back into modes of protectionism protecting myself the people that i love at least i think i'm protecting them and i cower sometimes in fear and i'm sure the bad report is still rumbling in the camp you know back in Numbers chapter 13, when the spies came back from spying out the land, they had that, big, that bad report. It's why they wandered in the wilderness to begin with. Oh, they're giants. We can't do this. What are we thinking? 40 years of wilderness wandering because of that unbelief. And the words, bad words don't just disappear. Did you know that? Bad words, fearful words, they don't just disappear. That's why when you feed yourself, you need to feed yourself the word of God. You need to feed yourself the faithfulness of God. Church, please be careful what you post and repost because bad words, bad words just don't disappear. You may go, oh, look at this and look what I found. And as you repost and as you, you're shooting a, an arrow right to the heart of a fearful saint and they don't just go away. Fear can feed more fear. Discouraging words don't just evaporate into the air. They have a way of embedding themselves into the very depths of our mind and emotions. And they tend to come back to taunt us in times of great faith and discovery. We must learn to wash our minds with the water of God's word. When we look to the future, even though we don't know what it holds for us, we know that God is with us. The promise to Joshua is a promise to us. His courage and strength is with us. 
And so I want you to come back to chapter three for a moment where it says in verse five, with all of this, you haven't passed this way before. So what does Joshua say? Sanctify yourselves. Tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. He speaks right into the depth of all that they're facing. He says, I want you guys to set yourself, sanctify means to set yourself apart, or you could say, prepare yourselves. Get ready, because tomorrow you're gonna see something special. You're gonna see something grand and something great. Why? Because God is a God who's already gone before us. He's already in the tomorrow on our behalf. I don't know about tomorrow. I'm not sure. There are many things about tomorrow that scare me, spook me, stir up anxiety in me. And even though I don't know what tomorrow holds, I do know who holds tomorrow. I trust him with my life, moment by moment. And even if I'm not equal to match the problems that will come my way, I will be in that place of abiding where the Lord will be my strength in uncertainty and in fear. In 1 Chronicles 16, 11, it says, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, the do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Psalm 18, verse 1, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. Verse 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God and my strength in whom I will trust. If uncertainty develops a new dependence and fear develops a new faith walk, then thirdly, Newness develops a season of learning and leaning into the Lord. Learning and leaning. God is taking us in life from glory to glory and strength to strength. And there is so much, church, for us to learn of the character and the nature of God. It is a truly lifelong pursuit to learn about the love of God and his goodness in our lives. There's so much to learn in your life and mine, so many areas for us to grow. And I can look back on my life and I can say that I've learned much about God and myself as he's allowed me to pass through the wilderness and valleys of pain. I've learned so many of my own weaknesses and over the years I really thought I knew myself until the Lord allowed circumstances to reveal that I really don't even know myself. Remember Paul even wrote, he says, I don't even judge myself. It's not even my own conscience that I'm leaning upon, but I trust in the Lord and his righteous judgment in my life. I think of Peter. He really thought he knew himself, didn't he? Remember what he said to Jesus? He said this to Jesus, like, look Jesus in the eye and said, and I believe he believed it. Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. He was already stumbling at that moment. (laughs) And of course, you know, Bible students, that he stumbled greatly and denying his own savior and best friend three times. What happened with Peter? He stumbled. He learned about himself in a very painful way. He didn't realize how weak he was. One of the revelations of weakness, one of the responses, I should say, to the revelation of weakness in your life is you fight it and want to appear strong. Instead of humbly acknowledging that you're trusting in the sovereignty of God, many people want to have their own sovereign protection of their lives. And God is revealing to you a place of weakness so that you can experience the promise that his strength is made perfect in that weakness. That God wants to strengthen you in those areas where you need it the most. It's good for us to know our areas of weakness. We need to know them so that God can make us more usable and more dependent and more committed to him who goes before us. God is able to give me strength and able to work with my weaknesses to give me the help that I truly need in the direction that he wants to lead me. In times of the unknown, what I've learned is that God is faithful and utterly reliable in every way, that he keeps his promises, that he's truly promised not to leave or forsake us. I've learned with God that even when there seemed to be no way, God can make a way where there is no way, that he can lead us for his purposes, that God, he's working all things together for the good, for those that love him, 
those that are called according to his purposes. They're, they're not, all things are not good. That's not debatable either. I think we can all agree that all things are not good, but God is working them all together for his glory and our good. There have been things in my life that I just don't understand what happened or how it happened or even why it happened, but God was there. And it's when we've come to the end of ourselves is when we really see God to begin to move and work on our behalf. Church, even though we haven't passed this way before, God is there. He's there to help us and to guide us. He's there to strengthen us so that when I look at the past, it gives me encouragement for today. I think all of us can agree that everyone listening to me right now can look back in the past of a difficult time in their lives and see the faithfulness of God. Well, as you look to that, you know that God will be faithful today. And although life is chaotic and out of control, many uncertainties and unfairness, I mean, there are things just you look at it, go, that's wrong, that's unfair. But I suggest to you, church, that when you begin to think that this world and its system is fair, you've become a friend of the world. The Bible says that our culture, this world, is under the sway of the wicked one. We are not under the sway of the wicked, and we are dwelt by the Holy Spirit, been baptized with power from on high. So there is a natural animosity between the darkness of this world and the believer that walks in the light. When you and I become very comfortable in this world, then we are agreeing with the sway of this world. And so God, he leads us to these times where we go, look, I'm gonna lead you to a place you have no resources, no ability. What will you do? And I believe that God would have us, even though I don't know the future, we will choose to trust in the Lord. We will choose to face that situation by faith because the past blessings of God in my life only guarantees the future blessing and faithfulness of God. Why? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. The past work of God in my life becomes a prophetic word of the future of the work of God in my life. The past deliverance of God in my life is predicting the future deliverance of God. And so we realize that God who has been with us is the God who is with us now and the God that has gone before us. God has gone before you, and you can trust in him. He has brought you this far, and he hasn't brought you this far just to drop you off. The Bible says that he who began a good work in you will what? Complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The psalmist even understood that God will perfect those things that concern me, and he will. Yes, church, it's scary, and it's hard, and it's confusing, and all these voices are happening and all these opinions are, and all this division and all this, uh, like, like you just, you can't even say something these days without somebody wanting to argue with you about it. I get it. I understand the world that we're navigating in right now. But God is bringing you into a deeper relationship with him where you'll learn to walk by faith and not sight, where you learn to trust in him, where you develop a faith walk that he guides you because you haven't passed this way before. It's all brand new. There's a depth and dimension in your relationship with Jesus that you've never experienced before. And as you enter in with the right perspective, realizing God is there, you'll be excited and anticipation of what God has for you next. You won't fight for whatever past normalcy you experience, but you will walk in anticipating with faith of the newness that God has for you in the future. Whatever God is allowing and whatever he's doing, it's going to be for his glory and for our good. And let me just say this. Let me finalize this as we come into communion. The rest and the peace that you want is not available and attainable through human effort. The peace and settled comfort that you're looking for in times of difficulty, fear, and uncertainty is not attainable through human effort. We see this as a picture here theologically. You'll notice that Moses does not lead the children of Israel into the promised land, Moses. It's Joshua that leads the children of Israel. It's Joshua that takes them in to the promised land. Moses and Joshua here become a picture and a type. 
Moses becomes a picture of the law, self-effort, following rules and regulations. Moses or the law or self-effort is unable to bring a person into the promised land. But Joshua, the Hebrew version of Jesus, of Yeshua, he can lead you into the promised land. He will lead you into the promised land. No, the law will not be able to do that, but the grace and finished work of Jesus, that will bring you in. A faith relationship, a true settled rest comes from Jesus himself. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. The peace of the world is not the peace of Jesus. And you won't experience real peace and rest until you finally surrender all of your fears, anxieties, uncertainties to the Lord. Jesus will lead us into that place of full trust and faith. No matter what comes our way, the Lord is with me. He will be with me. He has gone before me. He will help me and see me through. We can't see what's up ahead, but we can cling to Jesus who we do see high and lifted up. As we learn in Hebrews, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, what? Endured the cross, despising the shame. But he also, what? Sat down at the right hand of the Father. It is a completed work of rest and peace that only comes by faith in Jesus Christ. You will not get it any other way. You may give a piece of your mind, but it will not give you a piece in your heart. Because true peace only comes from the Lord. Let me end with this. Turn over to Matthew chapter six, as the worship team will come on back up and we'll prepare for communion. Would you turn with me to Matthew chapter six? I wanna remind you of the words of our faithful savior, Jesus, in Matthew chapter six. <clears throat> Just allow Jesus to minister to your heart, to minister to you about the future. Listen to him. In your mind, think of following him receiving from him. He says in verse 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you'll drink or about your body, what you'll put on. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? And so why do you worry? Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, don't worry, saying, what are we going to eat or what are we going to drink or what are we going to wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. But your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Did you catch a little theme from Jesus to us? Don't worry. Don't get caught up in worry. Don't be overly concerned about tomorrow. Trust the Lord today, if the Lord wills. Remember the sovereignty of God. Remember his faithfulness. Church, it might get better or it might get worse. I don't know, but I do know this. God will meet me where I am, what I face, when I face it. And I always chuckle at this. I, just, I always chuckle about those stinking birds that live in my house. They don't pay rent. 
They don't ask my permission, but they live in my house just like I live in my house. And they enjoy it. And I look at them. I see them on the trees. I see them on the roof. I see them putting their little nest on my front door. And I think, you know, the Lord's taking care of them. I'm not taking, I'm not putting food out for them. I have little signs here, no solicitor. Now get out of here, birds. I guess I don't know bird talk. But the Lord's taking care of them. I've never seen a bird walking on my sidewalk right up there going, I don't know what's going to happen. We, don't, we can't pay the rent. We don't know I'm going to feed my birds. They, they're just trusting in the Lord. So I invite you to a deeper level of trust today, church. I know we don't know the future. And I know it's easy to get caught up in everybody else's, everybody else's convictions, everyone else's beliefs, everyone else, how they're going to handle it. But the Lord's inviting you to bypass pastors and bypass your pastor and bypass your friends and into the very presence of abiding in him. That's where peace and rest is found. Not in men, not in structures, not in governments, not even in church families and friendships. True rest and peace is found only by faith in Jesus Christ. And he will give that to you. And so we're going, if you want to take the elements out of communion, we have a little extended time here. You guys watching online, get the elements of communion for yourself. And Josiah is going to lead us in a song. And after that song, we're going to take together. So hold on to them. Start to open them. Stay. Let's pray and maybe start in a time of prayer. Just keep an atmosphere of prayer so that the Holy Spirit can minister to us. So Father, we are asking for your wisdom and your love and your joy to infuse our hearts we know things are wrong. We know things that are untrue. We know things are, are, you know, the spirit of the Antichrist is among us, just like it has been from the first century. We see things prophetically lining up like never before. We see mandates and we see job threaten, threats. We see fears. We see people threaten to lose their job if they don't do this and threaten to lose that and they can't experience this and all of these things. But we also see people hurting and sick and even dying. We, we also see people hurting. It doesn't even have anything to do with COVID. There are people battling cancer. There are people battling Alzheimer's. There are people that have fallen down their stairs. There are people that are having heart arrhythmias and aneurysms. I, like there's a lot of stuff going on, Lord. May we be faithful and empathetic and caring for those human. May we not become inhumane in how we approach life because things are so uncertain. Infuse in us a freshness of your Holy Spirit as we prepare our hearts to remember you through the elements of communion.